Ladies and gentlemen, today we're joined by a unique dog sport personality. He's a third generation dog man, uh, pretty much runs in his blood, I see. Uh, you can uh, say he is quite accomplished in the world of working dogs helper work. Uh, I'll start rattling off his resume. I have it written down right here. 2013 Seeger Show, 2014 National Championship, 2014 Seeger Show, 2016, he certified as a teaching helper. 2016, he worked the Nationals again. 2016, Seeger Show. 2017, National Championship. 2017 and 2018, he worked a combined qualifier for the World Championship. 20, 2022, he worked the Nationals and the combined quality for the World Championships. And 23 Nationals, just again, the back half uh, helper work. He is Rory Kennedy. We're joined today by Rory Kennedy. Man. Uh, and he is also for for your work. You're uh, submerged in operator culture. You work as a law enforcement officer. You work for uh, you worked on multiple drug busts. So you have a lot of real world canine experience as well. Yeah, yes, yeah, some um, certainly not nearly as much as others. Uh, but I, as they say, we all uh, stand on the shoulders of the ones that came before us. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so let's take it from the top, Rory. So we know each other for many, many years now. And uh, you had this idea that we should uh, have this little chat and talk about dog sport, talk about dogs. So where do you think dog sport is and where do you think dog sport is going? Man, I think, you know, dog sport since since I've been around, which is my entire life, uh, it has, it's changed in so many ways. And the, the biggest, the biggest way that it's changed is that it's been completely the same. Uh, you know, it goes through evolutions, I guess. Uh, it goes through trends. I feel like we, as a, as a sport, specifically in IGP or whatever call they're calling it this year. Um, <laughs> I feel kind of like we're at a precipice, you know, sure. You get the memberships in different sports across certainly the United States, uh, which, which is where I have my finger on the pulse more than anything else. Uh, <clears throat> you know, different types of ring sports and PSA are growing exponentially. Sure. Wow we're kind of stagnant in IGP. Um, sure. And I, I personally don't think that's even necessarily a bad, you know, certainly I don't want to see us having back to the days of having 10 dogs in a national championship. Right. Um, but I actually, I feel from what I see and what I'm exposed to like dog sport, broadly is growing pretty well currently yes um i think you know I, I don't think this will be too too much of a hot take that uh social media is certainly a double-edged sword for sure but i think one of the one of the great positives in regards to dog sport uh of the advent of social media is that so many more people have been exposed to what dog sport is, what higher level dog training is. And because of that exposure, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, 10, 12 years ago, nobody knew what jujitsu was. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You, Till you know, the Gracie fast, brothers showed up on the scene. Exactly. You know, fast forward and guys, you know, Joe Rogan and Jocko have been yelling about jujitsu for 10 years and now <laughs> everybody knows. Uh, <laughs> And yet nobody believed it when they saw, you know, these giants being folded over like lawn chairs by a 170 pound man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> God, dude. The first instructor <laughs> I ever had is literally like a 120 pound Brazilian and trying to, <laughs> trying to roll with him is like trying to hold water. It's, it's miserable. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, I think that generally we're in, a very similar place as we were my entire life in dog sport, you know, sure. People through, throughout my life, people in dog sport have tended to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, everything is the end of the world. Every, every decision 
that the, you know, the SV makes is either the best or worst decision that's ever been made in human history. And, <laughs> you know, a little dramatic. Yes. Yeah. I would say. <laughs> you know, some, some, some of our friends and compatriots have. Yeah. They the have a lot of plus their pole moments. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, I, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's the greatest the greatest gift that I've been given by my lineage is that I, I just know to weather the storm and, you know, I've, I've been through it. I've seen all of the regime changes and the rule changes and the, I'm just, oh, okay. In a couple of years, it'll be different. And I don't, I don't get that spun up about it. Uh, you know, doing I, I kind of stepped away for a few years I had I had a lot of work commitments going on and frankly I was kind of just burned out I mean you you read some of the highlights of of my career I I yes. did a lot of big events into yes. and, you know, those are only the events that's not the training or the seminars or the camp. well of course yes they these are all the events that I rattled off in the beginning were at the highest level of the sport yeah. the uh, precipice of the sport yeah. And, you know, so I was a little bit just burned out and, and also, like I said, had a ton of work commitments and stuff. So I stepped away for a little while, uh, seeing the turnout and not just the turnout, but the, uh, the number of spectators at the last three years of national championships has been really encouraging to me. You know, again, I, it, it wasn't that long ago and I, I, I was there for them where we had 12 to 15 dog national championships. Yes. Now we're I remember that comfortably, we're comfortably breaking into forties. You know, that's really encouraging to me. I love and high level dogs and not just dogs that are just showing up. These are high level dogs that are going to be competing at the world championship representing the United States. Yeah. And you know, as I'm sure we'll get more into this deeper into the conversation, but, you know, as, as a, as a helper at that level, it is my belief and my opinion, and it just happens to be right that my job is to give the most fair performance to all of the dogs in order to put the best team forward for the United States of America. Yeah, so let's talk about, before we go there, let's talk a little bit about your background. You talked about, you know, knowing how to weather the, the political storm, so to speak, uh, which should be the least of our problems, but unfortunately, they become the most of our problems. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about your background in the sport. You were literally born into the sport, so let's talk about that, being yeah. a third-generation uh, dog man. Yeah, so my, my uh, maternal grandfather, John Hankel, senior uh began importing uh began importing german shepherds from germany in the late 1950s uh and developed a breeding program you know in at, at that point in time there were only german shepherds there were no show or working line they were just dogs uh he developed a breeding program. He was deeply involved in the police canine scene in Connecticut, which is where I'm from originally at the time. Which year is this? Which year is this? I believe, don't get me to lie, because I certainly wasn't there for it. Uh, I want to say <laughs> 57. Yeah, that's what I uh, that's what I thought it was 56 or 57. That's what I that's what I want to say is 57. That's certainly what I always yeah. say. So I, if I'm lying to you, I'm let's lying stick with that. Yeah. Let's stick with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, you know, established a breeding program, became deeply involved in training police dogs in Connecticut and New York state, especially. Um, and really focused on the aspect of, uh, of behavior. And, you know, he had a, he had a, an undergrad background in early childhood psychology and interesting kind of you know his his desire was to 
sort of transfer the the things he had learned in undergrad in early childhood psych into dog training because you know if you want to well you have a very young child pre-verbal not too far off from a dog behaviorally 100 percent right? I mean, they, and it's said that the dogs have an operating uh, intelligence of a two to three year old toddler, right? Yeah. Um, so that that really became the the dedication of his life, and and certainly the focus of his career. Um, and you know, so when I was when I was born in ninety two, he I was lucky enough that we shared a property together. He, we grew up literally houses next door from one another and like a big joint family. Yeah. Like uh, that's wonderful. That's a nicer way to say it than <laughs> uh, certainly sounds less, <laughs> less uh, Ruby Ridge. But, <laughs> uh, you know, so he and by extension, the dogs and his pupils were my babysitters growing up. Uh, sure. You know, he was, he was also my godfather and I was just, I was attached to him at the hip. And, right. you know, in the, the few years prior to me being born, my, uh, my uncle had sort of taken his own path in the dog world and sure. in, uh, in the competition world. And my mother had had also embarked on that with him. So I was just surrounded by, you know, that was the only. That's John, that's John and Karen yeah. Henkel for Karen the people Henkel. that don't know yeah. the, uh, that run the Willendorf kennel now. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was just I was absolutely immersed in everything dogs from, you know, I I often tell people that, you know, the only thing I have no exposure to in dogs at all are hunting dogs. Other than that, <laughs> everything dog related that I can think of, I at least have touch points in. Uh, yes. You know, I, I certainly am not an expert in anything, certainly not everything, but I've I have experiences of one kind or another in almost everything dog related uh and that was just i mean that was day-to-day life for my entire child uh the best way to grow up yeah yeah uh i got bitten far fewer times than i probably deserved (laughs) speaks to the test the testament to the temperament of the dog Yeah. yeah yeah uh and so I, I, I was fascinated with helper work specifically from sure for as long as I can remember, uh, you know, Sunday morning club training with our, with our training club. I was there every single Sunday driving my mother, uncle, and the other club members absolutely batshit crazy because I walked up and down the field constantly <laughs> popping whip for no reason. I remember uh, seeing those pictures. Yeah. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think from the time I was like three, I just was if there what the one thing they could get me to listen to was not to pop the whip with a dog on the field. Uh, <laughs> and it was just a, a true obsession from the for as long as I can remember. Uh, so finally, uh, you know, I got I got to be probably seven or eight years old. And started begging my mother to take me to all of the big uh, Schutzen, and at that time. I know that word is verboten now, but uh, <laughs> to all of the big Schutz and trials in the country. You know, the, the world championships in Boston, uh, national yes. in Wisconsin, which I think would have been two. Uh, uh, on tangentially, our friend AJ competed in that trial. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't hardly remember like what I did the last couple of days, but I remember specific competitors from those trials when I was like seven and eight years old. Cause that's the way my brain works. Uh, that's awesome. specifically I remember, and I didn't know that we were, we were family friends 
with them yet. I remember AJ and T Floyd specifically from Mad right. And uh, so I, I two you know, iconic looks got two guys hard to miss. Yeah, not not bad company to be in. <laughs> right, absolutely. So, you know, I started begging mom to drag me all over to these trials, and that was when I really, I sort of got the taste for the difference in training and trial helper work, and the difference is there. Sure. Um, one of the first guys I remember really idolizing was uh, was Chris Carr. I mean, because at that time, late 90s, early 2000s, he was yes. the guy. Yeah. And and rightly so. Um, sure. So 2001 at the Seeger Show in San Diego, uh, I had already – I had met and had a, you know, as, as a little kid, had a relationship with Dean Calderon, and he was set up at the Seeger show as a vendor for something. I can't remember why he was selling equipment for somebody or, or hanging out with them while they were selling equipment. Sure. And sure. he had an old dog that he competed at the Nationals with, Rex. Right. And we... You know, I was hanging out there because I I really looked up to Dean and but you know probably bugging the hell out of him all day. Dean Calderon, just you know, just for the viewers, is another doyen of the dog sport in the United States, and he's famous worldwide, and he's still involved in a big capacity. In the yeah, dog sport. yeah. I mean, Dean is another guy that liked T and AJ, and the list goes on. But due to have been around and been doing it at the highest level for carry the two forever yes uh, for sure yeah. and so dean was there with rex i was probably bugging the shit out of him all day and finally he uh, you know the the confirmation was over for the day and he set up a blind and said all right well do you want to work rex and i was i was nine right and uh so funny story um I was there with a, with a friend of mine, you know, his parents were in our training club and he was probably four years older than me. Uh, uh -huh. I went into the blind first and, you know, Rex came in and guarded and I just, I mean, I, I didn't freeze. I probably nearly pissed in my pants and just wouldn't. <laughs> I, I was like, I was like, no, nope, I'm good. I, I didn't actually <laughs> do this. Never mind. I'm out. <laughs> Then so, sign up for this. So the other kid, the older kid, went in, got in the blind, and took a bite. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. fuck that. And I got mad. And once he got done, I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not done here. And <laughs> I went back in the blind and wound up working, you know, in whatever way I was physically capable of working, like, a half-assed whole front half routine. Sure. And uh and as they say, the rest is history, you know, that brilliant. It was it was just I had the bug, I had it bad. And I think I want to say six months later, I made my mother take me to uh my first helper seminar. Which he yeah, it was at yeah. uh it was a greater greater Washington Schutzen Club in DC. Uh right. And it was T, Tim Cruiser, and some Dutch guy whose name I can't remember for the life of me. Uh, sure. He, he was hot at the time, and I, I, I can't remember who it was. Uh, worked my first Malinois, uh, got my first long bike catch. Uh, you know, I was just – I was eat up with it, man. I, that was all I wanted to do. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wound up, I worked dogs for another few years, took some time when, uh, you know, when football got really competitive for me, you know, played all through high school, wound up playing. Again, we have an international audience. So when you say football, you mean American football. American football. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one you throw, not kick. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I didn't do either. I just hit people a lot. Uh, <laughs> Defensive linebacker. Yeah. 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 But, uh, so I, I played, played football. The team's hitman. You played the team's hitman. Yeah, exactly. 
uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I like to play to my strengths. Right. So the folks that don't know, Rory is over 300 pounds, six feet, seven inches tall. Yeah, just a little guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I am I am also not the biggest one in my family, for the record. Right. That's true. So, that um, is true. Ron is still taller than me. Um, the family of American Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so yeah played played ball played in college for a year I was uh quite uh, I was asked in no certain no uncertain terms to never go back to that school they kicked my ass out <laughs> after my year and came back home and was asleep in my bed at my mother's house it was a Sunday morning I was absolutely hung over and probably wanted to die <laughs> and john came walking in the house and was like hey get up you're coming to training i was like <laughs> no <laughs> and he was like uh yeah okay i'll see you there in 15 minutes i guess i'm going to dog training today and uh it, so i i skipped over so they he had made me certify as a as just a club level helper sure uh what was that was wda the year before. right just wda because, was the was a branch of uh the german shepherd dog club of america yeah. it was a working dog association which is defunct now and all the affairs uh are run by the sv committee yeah. just for a little context yeah yeah uh <laughs> you know different branch of the same tree sort of. essentially yes um so they john who was also a teaching helper for the for the for the audience um yes he was doing a helper certification and he just needed another warm body he right. just needed somebody else to do and was like hey i need you to be there okay i hadn't worked a dog in like eight or nine years so sure fast forward a year i've been kicked out of school i'm not really doing anything except getting drunk with my buddies and nope you're gonna come work dogs okay as you do if if it'll sh it, seriously my mindset was if it'll shut you up for this morning i have a headache and don't want you to talk to me <laughs> and uh i you know the same the the bug who had laid dormant in me for however many years that I wasn't working dogs came back with a vengeance and you know I I began to attack helper work with uh with the same kind of appetite that I had you know that I had been that that I had had with football you know I right. when I wasn't on the field working dogs I was ingesting thousands tens of thousands of hours of trial film of training film sure. of, of great helpers and shit helpers and you know oh absolutely I wanted as to much as it is important to see what you want to yeah. do it's also very important to see what you don't want to do mm -hmm. and you know, I just became, I became a, as much of a student of specifically of trial helper work as I possibly could. And I, I, I tend to, I, I have the ability to be a little bit myopic and a little obsessive. And uh, that was just, that was what I did when I wasn't on the field or, you know, training in the gym or whatever, I was watching film of other trial helpers or of myself or whatever, uh, just completely immersing myself in the world of trial helper work. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, so when do you think your renaissance, so to speak, happened? That's hard to say. Uh, be, I can take very little credit. You know, I, I can certainly take credit for for my obsession, but I can't sure. take credit for my, uh, I guess, 
career path, career development, that was 100% John's guidance. You know, brilliant. I know what I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know the process by which to become, you know, I was a certified helper. Okay. I, I don't even know if I knew what the levels of helper certification were. Uh, sure. I, you know, he, and uh, I don't want to, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but what he has told me is, you know, he started to see the ability that I had and had this vision for where he wanted me to be uh, or where he thought that I could, you know, what he thought I could achieve. And, we had a discussion about it. He said, Hey, I, where it started was I want you to, you know, I think you have the ability to be a national level helper. I want you to do a secret show. Okay. Sure. So he flew up to, to our, to our club in Connecticut. Uh, and this would have been the summer of 2013. Mm-hmm. Uh, he flew Steve house up to our place and Steve, who I had known as a little, little kid, but hadn't seen in at least 10 years. And I won't, I won't tell Steve's story about when he got to the field and thought that he was going to be seeing some 21 year old kid and then saw me and was like, all right, so where's the kid? Uh, Because he hadn't seen me since I was like 10, but right. So Steve came up and I just, I just did what I did every weekend at club. You know, I I hadn't gone to any seminars. I hadn't gone to any certifications. It had just been John's instruction. Um, I remember him, you know, he was absolutely, he and my mother were light years more nervous than I was. Uh, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't hardly know what was going on, let alone have any nerves about it. He, John came up to me in the blind, like, Hey, you you know, trying to give me a pep talk. And I was like, sure. I was like, dude, I'm good. I I don't like, (laughs) (laughs) so, uh, so did my four. So for those of you who, who don't know, or who haven't seen the process, for a national level certification, uh, I don't believe this is written anywhere in literature. It's it's not an official thing. No, it's not a it's not a written rule. But the kind you know the the cost to entry the you, you can call it the the hazing process if you want to. Sure. Uh, for a national level certification or national level tryout, I guess the traditional task is to work for IGB IGP threes back to back to back to back to back with no breaks in between. So as you finish the side transport on the back half of the one of, of the first one, you go directly into the blind for the front half of the second one. And you just, you know, that serves a lot of purposes. One is just simply conditioning. You know, you, I, as a teaching helper, can't expect you to go work a high level championship with 40 to 50 dogs in it. If you can't work four not, dogs in one physically game. Yeah. And frankly, you know, more so than that, because working a championship, whether it's 40 or 50 dogs or 10 dogs, you know, you're only working front or back half. Yes. And, then there's another, you know, there's the other part and there's a critique in between. It's not super yes. demanding as far as a, a stamina thing. Sure. I want to see how much desire someone has to achieve that certification. And also the thing is, sorry to interrupt you, but also the thing is your body starts breaking down after a point, after you catch so many dogs in the trans, in the, in the escape prevention, then so many reattacks in uh, back transport, your arms start to tire. And it's not not for none. If you're nervous or something, I yeah. can say this from personal experience. From the first breed survey that I worked, we had 20 odd dogs. And we had like 10 dogs that I had to carry, mm-hmm. essentially to help them uh, meet the requirements to pass. 
Right. The next 10 were certifying for the national championship. They wanted to get their breed survey. Yeah. And, and it was. And they're all supposed to look the same. You have to do exactly the same work from the first to the last. So it yep. gets a little taxing, especially if you're nervous. It's like when you're fighting, you, if you're clenching your fists and throwing the whole time, yep. you're tiring out. Yep. Exactly in helper work, if you're just clenching on the sleeve the whole time, your arm's going to be dead after a few dogs. Yeah, 100%. So, so uh, just a side tangent for uh, yeah, the yeah. people that might not realize that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, went worked, worked my four dogs, and actually Steve wanted me to work – uh wanted me to work a fifth i can't remember what it he oh that's what it was i so at the time i was doing only a running drive and sure. i was always you know one of again one of the one of the things i you know i tell people a lot about helper work that i i cheated because <laughs> i just i want just pick him up and go well, I walked into, yeah, I mean, not, not even physically, but I've just, I've been in this world my entire life. So when I first got back to doing helper work or, or, you know, even before that, when I was 10 years old working dogs at club, John would say, okay, run, drive this one, skip, drive this one. And sure. that was just, I didn't understand when I was coming up that that's not normal that sure many guys out there are not able to interchange back and forth i was sure just, I was always taught to it's it's like if you take a kid who's learning to play guitar and you teach him how to play righty and left like i just that's what i did so sure. at the time it's I was, muscle memory essentially yeah a 100 percent and well, also when you notice styles when we talk about helper work styles so the running drive you, know, you pick up the dog and you go and you're you got that you're carrying the dog over here a little bit. That's more of a German style. It's the old school. And, you know, so I personally, uh, like the old school DBG, I call it yeah. violin. You're playing the cello. Uh, yeah. I I am not a big fan. I have no issue with a running drive. I, sure. I now kind of actually do somewhere in between a run and a skip drive. It's yeah. weird. I, I, I don't know if I'm limping or what the hell it is, but wherever you find your rhythm. Yeah. yeah, I just kind of do it. Um, and, and the, the skip drive has traditionally been more associated with like the Dutch and the Belgian. You yes. Know, slower, more pressure, more over top of the dog. Yeah. Uh, so at the time of my tryout, I was doing primarily running drive. I worked my four John, I don't know if this was by accident or not, but remembered that, oh, hey, you've got to see him do the skip drive. It's fucking July. It was like 100 degrees out. And the only <laughs> thing I had at the time was the leather Schweiker pants. Right. You're so, in the sauna suit and the poor dogs on you. And, and I was competing in powerlifting at the time. So I was like 340 pounds. <laughs> and... So they're like, oh, yeah, just work another one. You work another one. But so we brought out uh, we brought out one of the dogs again. And I think I just did the front half with him, uh, you know, showed Steve the sip drive. And, uh, you know, S Steve, who now has been one of my biggest mentors in dogs, but has been truly been family to me for, you know, for 10 years. Uh, he, we always joke when I, you know, he and I joke together that I don't care if either one of us never works a dog again, like he's family to me. Uh, sure. A couple of weeks later, I went down to his place. He was in Virginia at the time and worked. So, so again, for the, for the audience, those who may or may not know there, though there is crossover, it absolutely exists. There is generally a difference in the working drives and abilities of working line dogs versus show line dogs. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There I, is, uh, there's very function specific breeding done. 
and on this point. Yeah, there is there is absolutely crossover. There, yes. You know, I there's great dogs that are good. Yeah. There are great working dogs that are good looking, and great good looking dogs that have the ability to work for sure. Um, yeah. So the the dogs that my family primarily breeds and has are show line dogs. Now, sure. One, one of those four dogs, uh, two as a matter, two of those dogs that I did my tryout with were John's. What the hell? It, it was it was still Schutzen at the time. Schutzen three dogs of his that he had bred and that were in his breeding program. So again, sure, you know, the two are not mutually exclusive, and I want to be clear. Yeah, about that. absolutely. Also, uh, the requirements need to be met by both quote unquote show lines and working lines. So. You need to get IGP titles, as it's called now. Back then, it was Schutzen titles. And you need to have a breed survey before you're allowed to breed uh, or legal to breed in Germany. Right. So ideally, the concept is every single dog should be able to function on the spectrum of the sport. Yeah. And ultimately, it comes down to what's the primary focus. You know? Absolutely. Uh, I can... If, if I... If I was still uh, competing in powerlifting, but I also liked to go for a run on occasion. Sure. Primary goal is to be as strong as possible and also be able to run a little bit. Versus if I'm a marathon runner who likes to lift weights on occasion. That's, that's Absolutely. the way I Absolutely. Um, they're, they're, they're both competing in uh, athletic endeavors, but they're right. very different athletic endeavors. So, uh, so, you know, my, my club at home is primarily a show line, uh, a show dog club. Century or a show centric club. Yeah. And, you know, we also, we've had Dobermans, we've had Roddy's, we've had, we've had everything under the sun, but primarily show line dogs. So sure. Steve, his club in Virginia at the time that, that actually still exists. He's just, he's not living there anymore. Um, they were, a uh, working line primarily club. So sure. I, went, I went down to him a few weeks later. He wanted to see me sort of under a little more pressure from a different variety of dogs. Yes. I had been so isolated in our small club in Connecticut. He was like, hey, the ability is absolutely there. I want to see you work, number one, Dogs that you don't work at your own club all the time because that is significant if you're going to go work a you know a major event. Yes, and to, you know work some dogs that may have uh, some stronger or some different drives. You know, sure. uh, so went down there to his club, had a hell of a weekend. Uh, was actually able to certify for national level with another, you know, dear friend of mine that I've known for my entire life, which was super cool. And who's that? Uh, Pat Kuhn. Pat Kuhn. Um, who's currently in the GSDCA judging program for breed yeah. judge and trial judge. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. You know, Pat, Pat's another one like me grew up in this nonsense. Uh, I have known Pat literally my entire life. I, yes, Pat remembers me before I remember him because I was in diapers, uh, <laughs> and so uh, a month and a half later, I was doing my first Seeger show. Brilliant, uh, and I got to do that with again. You know, I, you mentioned it in the first thirty seconds. Standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, absolutely. I, I have had an unparalleled opportunity to spend time with work with learn from and develop deep personal relationships with absolute legends in this sport and and that's primarily because of the exposure i was given to those types of people because of my family um 100% you know my the, the the contacts that I have in my phone, no one who is my age and has been around for really in, in on the broad 
spectrum has been around for nine years, nine and a half years now. No one should have the phone numbers that I have. <laughs> and, and most of that is exclusively because of my family and the exposure that I've had to some of these people. But well, so I, like the saying, the like the saying goes, you know, showing up is half the battle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just being by the virtue of just being there, the opportunities present themselves, and yeah. then you need to be able to avail them, be driven enough to actually make something off them. Well, and I was, I was also, I was brought up by my family to have such reverence for these people. So, that is, that is, that was what I was going to touch on. It's like that part is so important when you realize the the temple that this thing is that the people yeah. have built it with such passion. And to actually recognize those people for what they've done, to give their reverence to them, to give their so as you know, as the kids call it, I'd say the as we give them their flowers. Yeah, and to uh, you know, for anyone who is in the audience who may be sort of on the up and coming in the dog sport, to how do we say that? Shut the fuck up when you're around those people. And just absorb Listen, the knowledge. That you got they two have. ears and one mouth for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I got to do that first, uh, that first Seeger show with Steve House and Charlie Purdom, who were guys right. that I grew up watching do helper work, and that was super, super surreal. Uh, the last show Steve and Charlie did, if I, if my memory serves correctly, was the North American Seeger show in two thousand and nine in California. The, the last one before mine? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> that sounds right. That was kind of when I was, you know, when I was doing my dumb teenage shit. But I, I believe. Yeah, when you were on your sabbatical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> that's a comfortable way to put it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was super cool to be able to to be able to share the field with those guys. Uh, I believe I could be mistaken, but I don't think I am. I'm pretty sure that was la uh, Charlie's last national level event. Yes. Yes. The 2009 NAS, I think was uh, in Pomona, California. was the national last, last, last national that he did. So this was 2013. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, this was NAS in 2013 in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Bridgeport, Connecticut. That's right. Sorry. Yeah, my mistake. Uh, yeah, because he was also there for the back half of the <laughs> one in Chicago. Okay. I yeah, yeah. Now I just, you know, yeah. old brains, you know, they take a little rust <laughs> to kind of dust off. You know, the little WT-40. Oh, dude, I hear you. The, the <laughs> CD is real. Uh, but so all kind of at the same time, for those of you who remember, probably two weeks, maybe a month prior to NAS 2013 were the world championships in Philadelphia in 2013. Yes. Yes. And uh, my uncle John was heavily involved in not in the actual selection process for the helpers, because that was, that was to the, the judges. judges. Uh, yes. But, he was heavily involved in coordinating that selection process. And at sure. the time he was, you know, he was a, it wasn't still is a teaching helper, uh, had been a member of the helper committee for quite a while at that time. So he, he had his hands pretty deeply in that process and sure. through the whole thing. So I, I mean, I didn't get any inside information or anything like that, but I got to view and study all of the tryout film that those guys had, you know, from all their tryouts, from whittling down. I want to say they started with either 12 or 16 guys and yeah. then ultimately whittled it down to four who went to Philadelphia yes. the weekend and they chose the front, the back, and the alternate. Um, who, by the way, let the record stand, for my money, that was one of the best performances at a world championship that I've ever seen or seen on video uh, was. Oh, absolutely. Safe. Mark Torrance on the front, yeah. Mark Torrance yep. on the front half, Jeff Batiste on the back half. In my opinion, it's right up there with some of the best performances of a helper team that's yep. ever won the championship. Always uh, safe, always consistent. Yeah. And so 
And I, I unfortunately I wasn't able to be there in person for the for the worlds that year. But all of that going on at the same time and me kind of being new to the scene, but having missed out on the opportunity to try out for that championship was just fuel on the fire. And I got done with the Seeger show and I was like, all right, what's next? Because I missed the world, but I'm I am. I was extremely proud and grateful for the opportunity to have done the Seeger show, but I was not even remotely satiated and sure. like, all right, what's next? Uh, so, you know, just as with the beginning of my career, back to the drawing board with John and what's next. Uh, and that was when we started sort of plotting the course for me to get to doing the national championships that following springtime in, uh, in Greenville, South Carolina. And that was enter Carl Smith into my career, which he is another number one is another, another doyen of the American dog sport. Yeah. Yeah. Another legend in dog sport. Another, uh, another person who I consider you know, family and who has absolutely been with me every step of the way from the time we began working together uh, in in January of 2013, or excuse me, January of 2014. Um, and you know, there are there are few guys that I have worked with ever who have the the eye for the the intricacies of high level trial helper work you know when when i'm preparing for any championship for anything there's going to be a tryout for whatever i go to carl's place number one we're 30 minutes away from each other which doesn't hurt things sure um but carl will uh, you know, Carl will watch me work a dog and tweak my sleeve angle on an escape bite by two degrees. And he is that meticulous about wanting things to be perfect. <laughs> and when you get to a certain level and, and want to continue to perform at that level, that's the kind of perfection really there, there's no other term for it you know that's the kind of perfection that you need to strive for and uh i have not worked with anyone that comes instantly to mind who has that eye for such intricacies of high level helper work as carl does and so mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So I was saying uh, what I wanted to say was if you want to become a high level helper, always like they say, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room you're in, or if you're the best person in the room you're in, you're in the wrong room. So always surround yourself with people that know more than you, that have done more than you, that have seen more than you, and bring that to attention. It's Extremely important if you want to, you know, because it's a hands-on trade. In yeah. Sanskrit, uh, the language Sanskrit, there's something known as parshvidya. That means learning from touch, right? Mm -hmm. If you must touch it to learn, right? You can't just read books about it without yeah. doing it. Like I can read the book from Mr. Helmut Reiser about what a great working dog should be and how to train your dog and blah, blah, blah. And I think, all right, I'm ready to go. Or I can, you know, read the original uh, book by uh, Mr. Stefanitz, the breed's founder. And know exactly. Oh, yeah. I know exactly what the shepherd should be. But then there's, they say it, the picture is worth a thousand words for a reason. If you don't actually see and when you actually are able to go and touch, we're not just looking at a picture. When you're actually able to touch and feel and do. For, or, for example, you can watch a million videos of archery. If you haven't lifted a bow in your own hand, you will never know what archery is, or you could be the biggest boxing or UFC fan. If you've never thrown a punch yourself, you don't know what fighting is about. If you've never been hit in the face, 
you don't know what fighting is about. Exactly yeah. the same for helper work. And if somebody's not there to take you through that turbulent ride, no amount of videos can be a cure for that. And man, that's uh, that is one of the things as a as a teaching helper. And you know, I I try now as much as I can to to be available as a mentor to the guys who are coming up behind me, like guys like Steve, like Carl, like sure. you know, Phil Holscher, T Floyd, a million others who were generous sure. enough with their time and attention for me. Uh, yes. And credit to them. Yeah. The sports yeah. richer because of them. Absolutely. And, you know, I certainly wouldn't, I'm, I'm not shit anyway, but certainly wouldn't be without those guys. Um, you know, what I try to express to young guys coming up so much is exactly what you're talking about is look that, you know, number one, dues have to be paid. They, they just, yes. you know, I, I'm in a unique position. I get to sit around at the old guy's table even though I'm 20 years younger than them because, but sure. you know, at the end of the day, I've been, I think more, you know, you know, maybe, maybe 30 work. years, maybe yeah, 30 I've been years doing younger than them. Work for 22 years. Right. You know, uh, but, and you barely hit 30. Yeah. I'm 31. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. Uh, you know, but the, the, one of the most dangerous things to a, to a new or a young helper who has talent is someone who is going to tell them how good they are or could be. That's, that's like cancer to them. It's yeah. the story of Icarus. That's the story yeah. of Icarus. You want to fly as close as possible to the sun. Sooner or later, your wings are going to melt. 100%. And oftentimes those wings are attached to a loose woman. Another warning for you young helpers out there don't uh, we know it but that too, those are the two <laughs> most dangerous things for a young helper i swear to god um you know just you know exactly to your point if you are surrounded by a group of people who only want to tell you how good you are get as far away from them as possible absolutely and i've seen it with countless young or new helpers who do have tons and tons of talent. And I understand, well, I think I understand why it happens. I think because a good helper is so hard to find for most people. Yes. When a club gets their hands on that person, they want so badly to retain them. Yes. That they just sit there and stroke that ego till the cows come home so that they, so that they keep that person around. And right. why am I going to go to Steve house or Rory Kennedy or Carl Smith to get yelled at when yeah. I can just train with this club of 70 year old women who tell me how great I am all the time. Why not? Yeah, sure. Uh, or it could be managed. I mean, it doesn't really have to be the 70 year old women. It could be, you know, a bunch of guys yeah. who would say, Oh yeah, you're the best dude. You're the Absolutely. best. You know, you're great. I do say those guys, they have no idea. Bro. Yeah, I do say 70-year-old women for a reason because I've seen that more. But you're absolutely right. right. Well, also, I, I, I like the term more the Kartoffelsalatleute, the potato salad people. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. No, that's, in, I think that's more appropriate. In mind and in body. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. No offense to potato salad. No, it's the salad of my people. Uh <laughs> quite you delicious know. <laughs> you know and and that's so also speaking to this point you know the you have to touch it to learn it you have heard me scream about this countless times being a certified helper at whatever level does not make you a dog trainer. That's exactly what I was going to touch on next. You read my mind. 
So let's talk about the difference between actually raising dogs to go to those championships and those trials and being a decoy versus a helper at those championships. Well, and I, I'll even make, I'll, I'll add a delineation there, which is that there's, and we could, we could get super into the weeds. There's sure. We're here for it. There's breeding those dogs. Yeah. One raising those dogs, which is different. Sure. Training those dogs. And then the final piece of the puzzle is being the dude who tries not to fuck it all up as the helper at the event. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or the guy who thinks he knows too much and never lets those poor dogs ever make it to the level that they were, they could have made it to. Yeah. The so-called washouts are usually because of washout helpers. Yeah, absolutely. Or certainly, I don't know if I'll say usually, but they absolutely can be. Um, (laughs) And for clarification, those four roles are not mutually exclusive. There are some people out there who can do all four. Absolutely. In my opinion, you can, and to be fair, a lot of the the guys who come to mind when I think of this were physically capable of that level of helper work, but are just they're you know they're over the hill at this point as far as doing right. Well, father they time, have, father time is undefeated, but they have the knowledge, and, and sure. many of them have the experience. Some of them we have just we we've mentioned in this conversation. Yeah. Those people are on such a short list that, uh, you know, my opinion, if you're getting into, if you're starting out in this sport, whether it's as a helper, as a handler, as whatever, choose where you want to, you know, absolutely choose a goal. If you want to make the world team, great. That's, that's a great goal to have. Have that be your singular focus. Absolutely. If you want to work a national championship or combine qualifier as a helper, it's a great goal to have. Have yeah. that be your sole focus and your sole determination. Yep. I've seen a number of people over, you know, over the years – who, again, in my opinion, they want to do too much. And I don't think people understand that a lot of, you know, a lot of the names we've brought up in this conversation, a lot of the names that are sort of always at the tip of people's tongues in this sport, we're talking about decades of Oh, yeah, easily, easily, multiple decades. You know, the... The people that I have learned from most in this sport, put them together, and it's hundreds of years of experience. Right. That and there and no- it's evolving experience. It's not just what they grew up with and they stuck yeah. with that, you know, because the sport has evolved so drastically in the last, let's say, 30 years or so. So it's evolving experience, knowing having knowledge of the past. And adding new information as they go along. And then it's up to you when you see what's working for you, what's your style, let's say, what works for you as a trainer or a helper, what you can take from each person. Like you're stealing from your, with your eyes, you know, you can watch and learn. And what you don't want to take, you don't take. And what you find value in, you take and you move on. You know, one of, uh, another, another one of my mentors who took, who spent an exorbitant amount of time with and on me when he absolutely didn't have to Phil Holscher. Uh, One of something he said to me many, many years ago that I have held on to since the moment he said, he said, look, I, I I was pretty new in the sport, uh, certainly on a, on a national stage. He said, I want you to have the biggest, toolbox on planet earth i want 
He said, if you watch Uncle Phil do some crazy shit that makes no sense to you whatsoever, I want you to remember it. I want you to ask me about it and why I did it. And I want you to put it in your toolbox. I don't care if you never use it. I don't care if you use it once over the next 50 years that you're involved with dogs. I want it to be in your toolbox because maybe you will use it someday. Or maybe you'll be 10 years down the road and think back to it and say, God, Phil, that was some real dumb shit. And <laughs> choose not to want to use it. Right. I want you. And that sentiment is something that since the moment he told me that I've carried into every aspect of my life, whether it's, you know, shooting, police work, defensive tactics, dogs, weightlifting, what, whatever, all the different shit that I'm into. I've carried that attitude into every bit of all of it. And it's something that, that I stress so much because it's, I mean, that's, that's the good shit. Uh, you know, that is such a valuable sentiment. And just like we're talking about, you know, I'm trying to, in a perfect world, I would sit down with all of these giants in the sport that we've talked about and yeah. just be able to absorb all of what they've got in their heads. Just be a sponge. Yeah. Just be a sponge. You know, that's not possible, but I can do my best. Back to what I brought up a little while ago. Shut the fuck up and listen. Listen. Two ears, one mouth. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, the last thing in the world that I want to hear when I'm around these people, these legends is my own dumbass thoughts. Right. Oh, absolutely. You're there I'm to absorb with, what they're telling you. I'm stuck with those all the time. I only get to hear <laughs> from these dudes on occasion. Yes. It's a very, very well put. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, be I I've been around a lot of dog training. I've been around a lot of dog trainers. I have trained some dogs. No one will hear me shouting from the rooftops that I'm a dog trainer. Nobody. Um but a perpetual student. Yeah, that's that, as best I can be. You know, absolutely. Uh, those those legends, those giants, those guys have earned that title. Yeah. That's, that's something I don't, I, I don't, and probably will never feel as though I've earned. Uh, and, you know, we, unfortunately, we have had, I've had to have some of those phone calls with, and you've, you've done a helper seminar and certification with me, even though yeah. that one was among people who I absolutely know and trust, I still gave them caveat like, Hey, getting through this weekend, you are not a dog trainer. I've had to make that was, to make those phone and that, that, where, you know, I certified you last week as a club level helper. And right. now I hear that you're charging people money to train their dog. You fucking Isn't that beautiful? Oh, there, man. <laughs> yeah, I know we spoke about it last time too. There's, there are some things that I absolutely hold sacred. And the, you know, when, when I was, when I was honored enough to have the title of teaching helper uh, awarded to me, that's something I hold very sacred. And absolutely, I, and as you should, as you should, yeah. it's a well earned distinction. Not not only that. Uh, so let's go into uh, a train. So let's first go into the training helper versus a decoy uh, conversation. Yeah. To expound to people, it's like everybody uh, for the longest time in the last ten years or so, from the working camp, so to speak, you always hear stuff like, and this is like a broad generalization, yeah. of course. It's like, we got to test the dogs. We got to test the dogs. No, my friend, you got to train the dogs. Yeah. The testing is going to happen in the trial. See, so I, 
I, I probably have a, uh, a pretty unique take on this because of my, like, I don't work regularly with a club. Sure. I, yes. I don't train dogs every week. I don't train dogs every month. Yes. I might only work dogs three or four times a year. You know, sure. my, my work keeps Currently. me busy. I, I, I've got a million things going on. Um, and when I do train, it's, I'm very particular about who I train with. Uh, anyone is welcome to come work with me. I'm seriously, anyone who's listening, if you want to contact me and come work with me, more than welcome. Uh, you may get thrown off the field. That's happened. But more than welcome to give it a shot. Uh, but as far as who, because my, my time as far as working dogs is at a premium, I'm very particular about who I give that time to. And it's the only commodity you can't get back. Absolutely. And I, for, for the millionth time in this conversation, you know, I've been very lucky to have seen, I, I've seen it all throughout the course of my life as far as, you know, club politics, club splintering off, clubs having, uh, you know, undesirable individuals or whatever. I'm very particular about who I work with. So to answer your question, I don't hear that very often in the circles that I train with. Yeah. Because they wouldn't be saying that shit very long and been sticking around with the, you know, with the people I train with. Um, sure. But to that point, so, <clears throat> excuse me. The the test of a dog is in the trial. Absolutely. It that, literally says trial yeah, in the name. That's, that's when the dog is set. Now, if we're talking and there's, you know, we can use some $10 terms like stress inoculation and sure. go down that road. But ultimately, in order for a dog to be trial ready, we have to incrementally introduce dogs to those levels of stress and pressure that they will receive in the trial. And part of the training process is to introduce those levels of stress and pressure to allow the dog an opportunity to make a choice to continue. And it's speaking specifically about protection, allow yes. the dog the opportunity to make the choice to continue to engage and then rewarding that dog by releasing that pressure and stress. And that's how we build their tolerance for that oh, stress. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the training of a trial dog, no, we're not just going to hammer them with pressure and say, oh, well, they got to, we got to test them. Like if you want to break a bunch of dogs and then send them, yep. to me, I'll send them to police departments, feel free. Absolutely do that. Um, but if you want to develop a dog for especially higher level trial work, that that's not going to fly. Uh, you're going to get one out of every hundred dogs that can handle that type of pressure on a, you know, on a daily consistent basis. The other 99 are not going to make it. Right. Um, and, you know. My, my favorite analogy for this is sending an eight-year-old kid to go box with Mike Tyson. Right. A prime Mike Tyson. Yeah. 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 It's, it's not going to fare very well for that kid. No. And, you know. Yeah. Look, let's <laughs> let's be real here if a, a, anybody who's worked you know the the width of dogs that i or the breadth of dogs that i have from from literally zero drive dogs who do not want sure. anything to that have to be coaxed into it yeah or who just won't <laughs> <laughs> to absolute gangbangers who will break their own teeth and jaws on right. because that you know 
a, a, a person, a decoy, whether it's suit, sleeve, you know, sport, police training, whatever. A decoy who knows what they're doing can run can, can run probably 70% of police dogs off of a field. I would say can run about 90% of sport dogs off a field. Sure. If you want to, you can. Yeah. Nobody wants that. It's no. like you know, back to back to a boxing or an MMA analogy. Right. If you throw some dude who's straight out of Pelican Bay into the cage and they're gouging eyes and ripping ears off and breaking fingers and shit. OK, that's not yeah. the sport that we are choosing to watch. No, it's no. a different game. Yeah. Having said that, in a trial within the rules and the scope of the sport at, at a national level. Let, let me again, give that disclaimer because a club trial looks totally different than a, than a national championship. Sure. But a national championship within the scope of, of the rules and of the sport, I believe that it's my job to present as much fair and consistent pressure to those dogs as possible. Yeah. And as a result, if out of 40 dogs, 35 of them fail under that pressure, so long as it's been fair and consistent, that's a result that I, as the helper, am comfortable with. Sure. If it's been within the scope of the rules, within – you know, what is, I'll say, generally considered good form and good taste within the sport. If I run all the dogs, I run all the dogs. It's it's a championship. It's a test. It's supposed to be a test. Uh, that is not the purpose of a training session. That's not the that's not the purpose of a club trial. It's not the purpose Absolutely. of Absolutely. Regional champion. Because if we start doing this, we're gonna kill the sport. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's Absolutely. gonna want to come forward when you only suffer defeat, defeat, defeat at every turn. And I was speaking to AJ about this. It's like when everything is getting so complicated and complex, when your grip, when your quality of grip, your quality of guarding, which is extremely subjective with yeah. every judge, or the dog is guarding two steps away, or he's guarding too close, or now he's bothering the helper. Or you said out in one tone one time and you yeah. outed the dog in a different tone. Yeah. What are you talking about, guy? Yeah. You're you're skinning well, the cat when the cat doesn't need to be skinned. You know, one of one of my personal pet peeves in judging and in what as what I see as an inconsistency in judging is the language around guarding. How many times <laughs> In a trial, do we and hear gripping behavior when they talk about fighting? Yeah. Hey, a dead passive dog on the sleeve is not fighting. That's right. not fight. Right. You know, but how many times in a trial critique do we hear that the barking should have been stronger? Yeah. The actual <laughs> yeah. rules say nothing about barking. No, it's, it's barking. personal opinion. It's intensity of the guard. Yep. Nowhere there does it mention barking. No, and, it does not. And so why is it perfectly acceptable in the sport for the out after the escape bite to typically mm -hmm. be a silent guard? Sure. But then all of the other guarding phases are supposed to have barking. If they're where not supposed it, to. Where does it say that in the rules? It doesn't. Yet we're seeing that in every single – and. Absolutely. It, that's that's it's one a circus. Thing. Is that it's a circus? <laughs> well, that's one thing that I'm glad to at least be able to say is that it is broad spectrum across the sport. It's not just one yeah. or two judges who are hammering on that. But sure, still, sure. Like, one of the things that I that I like to talk to you know other people who are immersed in the sport about and about you know trends and where we're going as a sport is you know if I were 
uh, a complete newbie and were showing up to my first trial. And I had a rule book in one hand and I was watching what was on the field on the other hand. What would and wouldn't make sense? What would and wouldn't seem fair? And would I want to choose to participate in this sport after having watched that interaction? Bit of a caricature. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, sometimes it is. And that is something I think that, you know, you're you're never going to get everybody on board, certainly. No, no, of course not. Well, that especially is the people that are benefiting from the system, you know. So yeah. the system has right. been, it's grown up like they've molded the system in their interpretation. Whether it's the right way or the wrong way, you know, they can be the judge because they're doing it. But it's ev- everyone's, the system. everyone's all pious and self-righteous when it's somebody else doing shady shit. When they're doing it. Not even, sh- it doesn't even need to be shady right. stuff. It's, right. It just could be. All right, you're doing this, or you got a black and red dog. Yeah. I have a gray dog. I already have a holier than thou attitude because, of course, my dog is going to be better in working. Right, right, right. It's uh, it got, one's got nothing to do with the other. And you know, little little things like that, whether it's you know inconsistency inconsistencies in judging, uh, misinterpretations, or lack of clarity in the rules and the way that those rules are judged down to, you know, just, you know, uh, a lack of civility in the community broadly. Are we, are we harboring and fostering an organization or a, a, you know, a a sporting environment that is likely to bring in more people or push people away? Which are we doing? I think it's definitely the latter. I had, I've had this conversation with multiple people, you know, not on video, of course, but we've had the exact same conversation multiple times. It's not conducive the way the sports become. It's not, it's too specialized. And it's again, like AJ was saying uh, in the last chat, it's more now for the trainers as a business than it is for the dogs. It's not, it's not dog centric anymore. It's like, it's the clicker and cookie training. You can do this and you can do that, but look, Look, now I can make the dog spin or I can make the dog jump this way. Or look, I can make the dog twirl its tail, whatever well, it might be. Something that's important for, you know, for everyone. And I think certainly for those who are of decision making, uh, you know, capacity uh, who hold, yeah, who hold the ability to make decisions for, for different organizations those folks those folks are not necessarily who keep the lights on you know the top trainers the people who are on the podium no. Every year. No. and i i spent a few years sort of down on those types of people as far as whether they're as far as what their importance for the sport is it's very I, easy to get demoralized when you look at these people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I feel very strongly now as though the you know the little guy, the weekend warrior, the the you know twenty year old girl with her first dog, the whatever needs sure. the guy who's on the podium every single year just as badly as he needs her. I agree. uh, I agree. And and maybe not even they need each other, but the sport needs both of them, you know, to grow. Absolutely. I truly believe that the, the brand new person or the person who all they want to do is achieve a ships and three with their dog. They don't care about championships. They're not trying to make money from it. They're not, you know, all they want to do is get a ships and three. In my opinion, those are the most important people because they're not doing it from any, uh, I don't know, a place of malice even anymore. Because they talk about, you know, uh, trainers, high-level trainers, oh, no, now this has become a job. And, you know, only certain dogs can make it. And you see these guys going through dogs after dogs after dogs after dogs. You see, like, four dogs in two years. It's like, come on, guy what's oh, happening to those it's it's just it's not about then it's not about the dog it's about your ego yeah well and and i'm i'm more speaking from what what i see as being important for the sport 
You know, yes. I th- I think the little guy needs that person at the very very top to you know to look up to, just as much as uh, I've I've spent some time with some dog trainers. You know, mm-hmm. you need in order to be a full time dog trainer. Uh, fucking clients. You need them who don't know anything. <laughs> yes. Who need your guidance. <laughs> and, you know, yes. I can say that I'm a professional pitching coach. Sure. Nobody's Nobody a pitch. Comes to me for pitching direction, then <laughs> that's, you know. What are you coaching? Yeah. It's like being the tallest midget. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> and I think. <laughs> I think that both of those, you know, both of those sort of characters within the sport and everything in between, all of it is necessary for the perpetuation and growth of the sport. You know, we, I don't believe that we as a sport can cater specifically to one any more than we can cater specifically to another if we want the optimal growth and, and longevity for the sport. No, I, I think that's definitely very important for people, but it's again, people are stuck in their bubbles always, even with politics. When you look at it, it's like, all right, I'm blue or I'm red. Or I love this guy or I love that guy, you know, screw uh, the other side, you know, they, none of their ideas are valid because I believe this one thing, you know, these uh, one agenda, party members it's like they've just got one agenda and they'll throw the baby with the bath uh, out with the bath water whether it's uh you know making friends uh, in high places or whatever yeah. it might be and most often it's nothing to do with the dogs there's yeah. no relationship to the dogs uh from what the political amb- and it's at the end of the day it's dogs right yeah. we're not we're not changing the world here yeah. we're just trying to inculcate and let our little hobby that we have survive and move yeah. forward into the next century or the next generation or even the, the next decade at this point. Because all we do is like Christian, I spoke to uh, Mr. Christian Lang uh, yeah. a couple of weeks back. Uh, he, he is, uh, you know, he's trained much of his own dogs. He has a very small breeding program. He has, he's a he, he's successful professional. One that I've known since I was like seven years old, I think. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And I I think I've known him since I was like 15 years old and uh, he was, and he's a professional outside of dog sports. So it's not, it's not his mainstay. So, uh, and he was talking about exactly the same thing. He's saying, you know, you need the people that are the little people that are outside this bubble to come in to see what we're doing to be a part of what we're doing because we've got bigger enemies at Bailey. Like, we've got wolves over the hill watching that, watching us like these so-called animal rights people yeah. that are trying to ban all dog ownership and stuff like that. Those are the people that are, that we want to watch out for, not the show people and the working people and uh, whatever infighting they decide to do over calling the sport, whatever today and changing this rule, or you can go over the jump this way or that way. And, Oh, that's going to kill the sport. That's going to yeah. ruin the dogs. Uh, this clutching of the customary clutching of pearls, so to speak, right. the prover- proverbial pearl clutching that they do all the time. It's well, just, you know, lucky for me, I live in a place that still values and puts a premium on freedom. So I don't give a right. shit. The rights people say, uh, I'll shoot them. And <laughs> I'd just like to get that out of the way. But, <laughs> You know, and back to I made mention of it early on in, you know, that I'm I'm encouraged by what I've seen in as far as numbers in the last three years of national championships. I don't want to give the impression that I, you know, I think this sport's falling apart or that it's a dumpster. No, fire. no. I, I actually, especially after. After the nationals that we just had last month. Uh, yes. It was really cool for me. It's the, it's the first national championship that I can remember in my lifetime where there were more competitors that I didn't know than competitors that I did know. And from Isn't that beautiful? Up, and from growing up in this sport and being around for 30 years, that's the first time that's ever happened. 
And, and also we had uh, another breakout star, the front half helper, Demetrius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, dude, thank God I don't have to be the young or the fast one anymore because now he's around. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I, I love that dude. Yeah, he's phenomenal. And he, I, I, I can't say enough good about him. Uh he, in so many ways, is exactly the the type of breath of fresh air this sport needs. Uh, Absolutely. But, you know, that that's the first time in my life that that has been the case, that there have been more people I didn't know than people I did. And that's amazing. That's that amazing. In and of itself is really encouraging. You know, we between between that, I believe that between the three judges that we had, it's probably yes. the best championship judging across the board that I've ever seen in this country. I, I think it was brilliant. They were all fair. They were all very yeah. consistent. And they were all and, very encouraging of the participants. And, and and I even more mean, like, if you if you look at it from a... From a there was no holier-than-thou attitude. Right. No, yeah. absolutely yeah. not. Just from, you know, you want to look at accomplishments of those three as judges... Yes. A pretty outside of maybe a Bundesliga proofung or a world championship, you are not likely to see that caliber to get a judging crew with that kind of resume across the board. Uh, even for even for the breed show, we had uh, Mr. Yeah. Rang, who's also a very well sought after judge. Absolutely, and he was extre- was extremely fair throughout the weekend. It was great. Talk. It was like a breath of fresh air. These people. Yeah. All of yeah. them. Yeah, I wasn't uh I didn't I didn't you know, I was still working on Saturday during the first day of the of the confirmation stuff and then Sunday yeah. I whipped and had a six hour drive back to Tennessee, but uh I heard nothing but positives from people who oh, had- it was great. It was absolutely great. I was there in the ring, I was doing the photography for the club. Yeah. And it was absolutely great. It was there was no, there was not one dog that you could say one way or another. I mean, it was and he had he had he was very cordial with everybody. He was not, you know, not a prick like some of the judges are. Uh, yeah. He was uh, really uh, encouraging of the younger handlers. He was yeah. very I mean, it was just everything was great. It yeah. was, and it was one mean, of my yeah. favorite events that I had not participated in. So yeah. there was no stress because I didn't have my own dog competing. Right. So from an outsider perspective, so to speak, it was, everything was well run. Everything was well timed. Everything was fair. And even for every competitor from the helper work to the judging on both sides. Yeah. And again, you know, I've, I've known, I've known him for a very long time. So none of that surprises me certainly, but it's, it's, it's still great to hear. And it's, and it's good for, you know, it's good for the sport. It's good for the organization. That's it. I'm I'm not going to go all the way down this rabbit hole, but I've I've heard more times than I can remember. Uh, you know, working more working dog helper, working dog type helpers talk yeah. about you know, oh well, if I ever do a Seeger show, I'm running every dog. You've heard it, I've heard it, everybody's heard it, and it's like, dude, uh, uh, okay, that's not the point of anything, right? It's like for so so who does that serve? Nobody, right? Like. It's comical. Oh, like, every time I hear it, it's so comical. Like, so, I, unless, until these, you know, these horrible show dogs start showing up at your working trials and, and you know, usurping your your trial ratings, what, what are they taking away from you? Like, I, I just, I don't know. But... You know, my, my my reason for bringing that up is at the end of the day, you know, first of all, uh, uh, the minority in this sport are people who do it every single day and make their living from it. Yes. So the large majority of people who are involved are spending their hard-earned time and money to participate in this sport. For and the love and companionship of their dog and yeah. something to achieve with their dog. And certainly, you know, I am the furthest dude on the planet from like a participation trophy guy. But right. ultimately, everyone just wants to succeed and be happy. Absolutely. And 
if we can pres- if we as a sport between you know uh judge- and we as facilitators have yeah. no right to take that away from them you know judging helper work ju- event administration whatever it is if yes. we can present the you know the fairest and most even playing field to everyone is everyone yes. always going to be happy with their results absolutely not and i don't care equity if that- versus equality Exactly. You yeah. know, if we can give everyone the best opportunity who, again, have spent their hard-earned time and money to be there and to participate, that is, you know, that's the best we can do as, uh, you know, as, uh, what's the word I'm looking, you know, as proprietors of the sport. Sure. Caretakers, and, the temporary yeah. caretakers. So Thank you. That's, that's what I was looking for, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's and I think it's our responsibility as people who've been so blessed by the sport to be where we are, to yeah. have imbibed all the knowledge that we've able to have gotten from all the ones that came before us. It's, I think, our responsibility to pass it on to the ones coming after us. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I. I really I, I enjoy. I enjoy the sport for a, for a number of different reasons. It's not even necessarily my favorite thing to do with dog. Like I love doing suit work. I love working police dogs. That's sort sure. Of, I, I don't do as much of it as, as I would like to. Uh, that's more like my speed. That's more what I'm into, but sure. I feel such a debt to IGP to what you know to this sport to you know, german type dog sport right from all of the things that it's given me throughout my entire life you know i feel such a debt to that that i i'll never step all the way away well to paraphrase miyamoto musashi uh he says once you know the way broadly you know it for all things Yep, absolutely. So it's applicable in that knowledge is applicable in every that discipline, that knowledge, that skill is applicable every, in every facet of life. Once you can plow through that 10,000 hour rule or whatever that is, yep. that you can plow through one thing and you can get really good at it because nobody's ever perfect at anything. Once you can get really good at it and keep hammering away at it. Some of them, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm talking about mere mortals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as as we're as we're hammering our way forward, we can gain so much benefit throughout our entire life through yeah. those things. Absolutely, and you know that the being able to sort of sit in the catbird seat to how this sport evolves, how it changes. I mean, because it really does. It's it's constantly evolving, as it should be. And thank God it is. Uh, and to be sort of sitting in the passenger seat to observe all of that and to also, for some reason, have conned people into wanting to listen to anything I have to say. Uh, and maybe have- I'm here for it. Yeah. And maybe have a little bit of input on that. Uh, (laughs) It's, it's super cool. Like, you know, this, this sport and this world has, has literally made my family exist. That's, that's That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. That's something that I can never go without acknowledging. Uh, No, absolutely. That's beautiful. I was, I was actually just talking to my mother the other day and I was like, you know, I, I can, I can retire from police work at 55. Um, and every day prior to being a cop and from every day after I retire until the day I die, I'll still be the dog guy. I won't right. be. Oh, it's lifelong. I won't be, you know, he was a cop for however many years or whatever. It'll be, well, yeah, he used to kind of do that at one point, but that's the dog guy. That's right, just absolutely that's, that's my lot in life. You know, that's that's the 
the gift and the curse that my family's given me. Uh, sometimes <laughs> it feels like one, other times it feels like the other. But, you know, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm really lucky to still have the passion for, for existing in the dog world the way I do. Uh, and man, I'm, I'm still just as eaten up with it as I was when I was three years old, popping a whip on the side of the field. So what advice would you give to upcoming, uh, young people that are either competitors or they want to become helpers or they just want to have fun with their dogs? Something to take away. Man, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll address each of them separately. Cause I, I think, I think they're they're I mean, they're certainly different in outcomes, but you know, for someone who. Let's break someone, them down one by one. Yeah. Yeah. For, for someone who just wants to enjoy their time and build their relationship with their dog. Um, I believe, uh, you know, let me give, give disclaimer. You should do that with German Shepherd Dog Clubs of America in IGP. Having said that, I don't care if it's, I don't care if it's dock diving or, you know, doing cadaver work or AKC obedience or whatever. Like if, if you're, if your goal is just to develop your relationship and enjoy your, your dog's lifetime with you, do it in whatever sport or application that you enjoy most and that your dog is best suited to. If you choose for that to be I, IGP, great. And I don't know shit, but call me anytime if you've got questions. Uh, you know, if, if that is your, if that's your drive, if that's your focus, then just do it. And don't, don't get caught up in the, in the minutia or the politics or, you know, well, I disagree with this judge at this trial or any, like, if you just want to enjoy time with your dog, just enjoy time with your dog, go to seminars, go to camps. Uh, I, I feel pretty strongly that if you start out with, I just want to have fun with my dog is the goal that may last one dog. And with your second, it probably won't be the goal anymore. You'll, I, I, I think you'll probably want more than that. Um, sure. But, you know, just enjoy the process and see where it takes you, I guess. Uh, when, when I hear I just want to enjoy time with my dog, I hear I don't know what the goal is yet. So that's true. Cool. See where that's it goes. like knowing at 10. That's like knowing at 10 what you want to do with the rest yeah. of your life. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a new a new handler. Uh, oh, the other, just sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. The other word for that is psych major in college. Philosophy. <laughs> major. Yeah, that's right. There we go. Philosophy major. Yeah. Or, or like me, who I was a, you know, I got straight A's in football and beer and that was about it. Uh, <laughs> but I was a, I was a political <laughs> science and non-educational history major. Gender <laughs> studies. I got yeah, another one. Yeah. <laughs> I studied one gender pretty extensively. Uh, <laughs> but, so if you are, if you're, a, if you're a new handler, and I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit outside of my depth here because I, oh, Lord, I have one BH under my belt from when I was eight <laughs> years old. With a dog who it's had, a start. Yeah, from a dog who had already done their shoots in three. We'll work on changing that. Yeah, no, the hell yeah. We, he says no, because he's retired as shit. Uh but that I'm talking about walking out the wall. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for for new handlers, uh a lot of you know, you see a lot of new handlers, and I don't think this is for I don't think this is a bad thing. You know, you see a lot of new handlers that might not have a dog that is capable of achieving the level of, uh, of performance and precision that that new handler 
sees from their peers as far, you know, from their other club members, from people who are competing at events from whatever. Be patient and trust the process. And I think it's also, I, 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 what I observe with new handlers a lot is that they haven't, that they focus 100% on training the dog and they never learn how to become a handler. Yeah. You know, I've seen, and I know you have more times than I can count people, you know, newer people who show up to a trial with a really well-trained dog and they are tripping over themselves the entire yep. time because all they've done Absolutely. is on training the dog and they haven't focused on learning to be their best trial handler themselves. Yes. Uh, now, that's absolutely something that'll come with time. But I think it's really important, you know, there are and I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to go through the list, uh, but there are plenty of people in this country who are out there and they're available as coaches for the dog handler pair. You know, sure. They are, and, and I view that as being different than just being a dog trainer. Yeah, uh, it's a cottage industry at this point. Yeah. You know, the, the folks out there who are really taking the handler, the dog, and coaching that team. Yes. And that to me is different from just someone who trains a dog. Uh, yes, absolutely. Not, not, in no way, shape, or form to say that one is one is better than the other, uh, because if I'm ever either, I'll probably just be a dog trainer because I don't like dealing with people that much. But if if you're comes if you're, with its challenges, yeah. If you're new <laughs> and you're wanting to, you know, you're wanting to squeeze every last bit out of this sport that you can. If it's within your means, if you're, you know, if if those sort of people are accessible to you, even if those sort of people who are, you know, who are being paid money to coach dog handler teams are not available. Just talk to the people in your club who have more experience than you, you know, say, Hey, I want you to ignore what my dog is doing. And I want you yeah. to watch me and critique me as a handler. Um, get one of the things that I think is lacking broadly in dog sport is get stuff on film. I like, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, and that's one thing that I, I mentioned earlier, you know, I took from my football career. I study everything on film, everything. I study myself. I study others. I study dogs that I'm going to see in the next trial. I see, you know, I, on the ride home from Ohio for the nationals, I was breaking down video of myself over the weekend because I'm obsessive about it. No, I think they're I, I the think only way to be to get of, better. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people who could really benefit from that, especially if you're brand new, you're not going to feel. No, the, you don't know the difference yet. You're making, you're going to have to observe them or have someone else observe them for you. Um, and as far as, oh man, new helpers. Uh, Let's talk about first the, you know, new helpers that are, uh, you know, that want to become training helpers. And then let's talk about ones that have aspirations for, you know, let's wor work in a national event yeah. or something. Completely um, different things. Yeah. So to me, they're a, a, a training helper. I don't, I don't consider a training helper to be the same thing as a trainer. Those, those are different things to me. Yeah. Um, now, a trainer may also be a training helper. Yes. But a trainer and a, a, a training helper is not automatically a trainer. And, and I think that distinction is important. Um so if you want to be a dog trainer, you th that's a that's a conversation for someone with more authority on that than me. Is that's that's sure. a concise way I'll put it. Um, sure. If you want to be a training helper, 
first and foremost, find a trainer. Uh, ideally someone who didn't just put it on their LinkedIn page, but who is actually a dog trainer and has <laughs> accomplished something. No, 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 LinkedIn? Yeah. Uh, I don't even know if that's a thing. I've never been on that website in my life. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, just because someone's printed up business cards that say, yeah. you know, canine dynamic advantage tactical bullshit whatever <laughs> all the buzzwords yeah doesn't make them a dog <laughs> but yeah. someone who's actually been you know longevity is probably a good thing to look out for uh sure, absolutely accomplishments are probably a good thing to look for i'd uh, say so and to to me the greatest the, the greatest attribute for a training helper um you know, obviously the, the ability to physically be able to do what is being asked of you is, is required, of course. But the most important attribute for a training helper is the ability to listen. Uh, you know, I have, I've gotten to a level of communication with the trainers that I work with most often where we absolutely do a lot of stuff non-verbally, they all have the, the ones I work with most often, they have a lot of faith in me and my decision-making and my timing. Um, so a lot of that stuff doesn't need to be discussed or, or verbalized while we're working together. But ultimately, unless I think it's going to harm the dog physically if I'm about to do something and they say, no, do this, that's what I'm yeah. going to do. Well, yeah, of course. Absolutely. And, you know, that to me is the job of the, and I almost don't like to use the, I mean, it's, it's the only term that makes sense, but when I'm talking about a training helper, I'm referring to the helper that's being used for training. Sure. Yeah. Because again, you know, your job in that scenario is to shut up and listen to the trainer and their direction. Because uh, they have a history of the dog. At first right. glance, if you've just right. met the dog, you don't know what's really going on behind the scenes or what yeah. the dog's past experiences might have been. Yeah. And you trying to import your spin on top of it might actually cause damage than help them. You know, and this is, it can almost be difficult for me sometimes to have. Sure some of these more nuanced conversations because there's a lot of stuff that I just do automatically because I've been doing it. Sure. Uh, but you it's muscle memory at this point. Yeah. But you know, you mentioning that just, just popped it into my head. Like, yeah, a lot of people, and I, I know for some, and I don't even mean the, the dipshit PETA crowd, but like uh, as far as, as far as training ideologies, the sure. use and efficacy of a whip. Yes. So I God. people disagree. Oh. With that. And I'm, I'm not getting it. Use it. Don't use it. I don't give a shit. But, <laughs> uh, you know, that when I'm, when I'm working people's dogs that I haven't worked before, that's always one of the first questions I ask is whip or no whip. Because I don't know what your dog's history is. You know, right. There are some, there the are whip some could mean completely different something to that dog. Absolutely. Based on his no. past experiences. There are some dogs who no, absolutely don't bring a whip on the field because this last moron trainer who got fired from the police department 20 years ago beat him with a whip for 10 sessions. Or conversely, oh, no, I want you to pop the whip every six and a half seconds because that's the only way my dog barks. But and it's a sport now. It's the whip, you yeah. know that whip. <laughs> Dude, I have been asked. To attract the dog <laughs> with one whip in each hand. I'm not even sure. Oh boy. I'm not what even what is the dog supposed to bite? <laughs> uh, less. But so uh <laughs> you know, and that's be as a as a training helper, you are there to assist in the training of the dog. Sure. Helper work broadly. 
whether you are training helper, trial helper, just the guy who your club has hoodwinked into taking bites on a Saturday or Sunday morning, the you that in the sport, we use the term helper instead of decoy for a reason. Absolutely. You, the dude wearing the sleeve, is the least important part of that equation. As far as, or that, that's a terrible way to put it. You. That's an honest way to put it. You are the, well, you are of the lowest priority. I'll put it that Sure. Way. Yeah. Um, oh, all right. Yeah. That no. works. And, and I've, to me, short of, you know, yeah, compliments are great, whatever. They, they make me kind of uncomfortable. But when I'm doing it, when I've <laughs> done an event, the best, what I am looking for as a helper is for no one to remember a freaking thing that I did. Because if that, if, if no one has remembered anything about me, that means the focus has all been on the dogs, which is the the way it's supposed to be. You couldn't have said it better. You couldn't have said it better. My job is to present the clearest, most fair and consistent picture to the judge in order for them to evaluate the dog. Yep. No one is supposed to be watching me. No. And no, no, no. divorcing your hubris from the actual picture that we're yeah. testing the dogs at, I think that is the most important thing. So like the yeah. helpers that put their own flair, I think it's it's a it's a bad thing in my opinion. It's a it's a bastardization of your role. Absolutely. It's a caricature of it. Absolutely. And, you know, I now there is absolutely a dichotomy there because I don't believe that you can achieve the highest level of helper work without having a fucking massive ego. (laughs) If you don't believe in yourself, who else will? Exactly. Like, dude, you, you are making the some would say mentally ill decision under no duress to go get I concur. around and bitten by dogs. Nobody's like, got a gun to your head. <laughs> yeah, that's there is something not right with you. And the only explanation for that, short of mental illness, is just massive ego. Yeah, it's, I keep telling uh, whoever, you know, is willing to lend a ear, it's like it's not a matter of if you're going to get bit, it's a matter of when you're going to get bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And I'll I'll answer that if you're in if you're a national level helper, you will get bit in a seeker show. Uh, oh yeah, will surprise you. It will be on the left or right knee or on the. Right. Um, I've been bitten in zero working dog trial or you know trials ever. I've been bitten in every seeker show I've done. So just <laughs> let me say that. Thick um, pants. We need thick pants. Oh God. And I may or may not have been bitten by members of my own family's dogs. Uh, <laughs> Can't confirm or deny. <laughs> but, you know, and so if you're, if you're getting into the Don't sport, worry, mom's proud of you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, <laughs> it's a good thing I live a thousand miles away now because she, they get beat about the head for certain comments I've made. Um, if you're... If you're in the sport and you have you have goals of being a, a national level helper, a championship level helper, um, number one, you know that, and I, I say it partially in jest, but you know, sure, have have the biggest ego in the world, learn to keep it in check. Um, yeah, I know when to inflate it and deflate it. And, you know, I will. I think maybe there's a, maybe the better way to put it might be, or a different way to put it might be, know your self-worth, essentially. Yeah. I mean, this is a great, uh, I don't know, like a philosophy lesson. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, all right. So quick, quick anecdotal example. Uh, sure. You know, Mark Torrance, one of my absolute closest friends in the sport. He is my brother. I love that man to death. He and, and I, a great I, helper. Yeah, and a phenomenal at the highest level. Phenomenal helper. 
Uh, we mentioned him earlier in the conversation for working the Philly Championship, the World Championship in Philly front half. And, you know, countless other championships in between. Yes. Uh, for both GSDCA and DVG. Sure. Uh, you know, Marcus family. I love that man to death. I think he and I have now tried out against each other. It's been either two or three times. I can't remember. Um, every time we do so, before we before we kick off the tryout, we give each other a hug, and I say, "I'm going to beat your ass," and he says, "No, fuck you. I'm going to beat yours." And that's <laughs> I. I that's love, great. I love the man to death, but that's yeah. I walk that's great. with the absolute belief that I am the best helper out there. It has to be so. At that a high what, championship level, yeah. you cannot have any self-doubt. Because if you have self-doubt at that level, because, well, well, let's preface it with this. You've made it to that level because you are a certain caliber of helper anyways. Yeah. Some Josh Moore walking off the street cannot be at that level. Uh, like you said, at that level, when somebody's only hoodwinked them to catch dogs or take bites in their club, all right, cool. Keep, keep, stay humble. Keep working on your craft. Yeah. Get direction. But once you've reached that level, that elite level, when you're a national level helper, you're at the tryouts for the world championship or the national championship, you better have all the self belief in yourself because yeah. if you have a moment of hesitation, you're going to hurt a dog. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. Um, so, you know, if, if that, if your goal is to work championships, um, I think, I think it's a constant process of self-evaluation of why do you want to do that? Yeah. Um, if like, for me, it was never, uh, it was never out of some deep sense of altruism that, oh, I want to do this for the sport. It's like, Dude, I don't play football anymore, and I need a competitive and athletic outlet. No, it's a test of yourself. You're always I mean, trying to test yourself. Absolutely. That was, you know, yeah. that was what that's the only reason you're there. For sure. And, you know, that's it, – it's certainly evolved over the years, but – Well, you can assume, like, like we said, like anything competitive has to massively do with your ego, whether it's the For handler sure. on the field with that dog who's gone through like seven dogs to reach that eight dog that comply with his training and his methodologies, whatever, to that helper on the field, to that judge on the field who's been selected for that because he's worked all his life in that sport to reach that uh, pinnacle as well. For sure. So it's like, it's like one ego over another ego over another ego. And when you have that, then you better have self-belief. Right. Because you're going to get checked. Yeah. And, you know, uh, So advice for a guy starting out. Um, I guess, how do I want to word this? Uh, um, work with and learn from everyone and the people you need to continue to listen to and continue to work with will self-select. Uh, I would say if – if you have the natural ability and physical talent to achieve that level, anyone who tells you, no, don't go work with other people, tell them to fuck right off. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you, one cannot, I, I will never sign off on, uh, on a national level candidate as a teaching helper who has only worked the dogs in their club. I, I will not do it because I need to know that. And, and people, you can pick up shop, go elsewhere, and work well, the dogs with the same consistency you know, nowhere else. People, people probably, but there's probably a lot of listeners who don't understand this. Uh, you know, sure. Dogs are dogs in this country can be highly regional. So, like, yes. Dogs on the West Coast do not work the way dogs in the Southeast work. Because they've only developed on the helpers from the West Coast. Right. And there, yeah. you know, there are absolute, uh, now there, 
they're subtle. So some, something to put that in context again. It's like, let's say compared to a, Ger- a country like Germany, that is the mm-hmm. size of Wis- the state of Wisconsin. Right. America is massively expansive. Yeah. Just to drive across, if you're just driving one straight shot, I've done it a few times, from Florida to LA, LA to New York, yeah. let's say, it takes three bloody days. Yeah. And that's just with pee breaks and uh, bathroom breaks and food breaks. That's it. Yep. You're not sleeping. You're not stopping. You're not sleeping. You're just going, getting in your car and going, as you yep. do for many national events. Yeah. A close by trial would be six hours. Right. Yeah. So it's it's a massive time commitment. Like so, a lot of people I think globally don't understand how big or massive an undertaking it is to uh, do the sport in America, and how much you know we our our geographical size is exponentially larger than that of germany and the, oh yeah the um the 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 density of the dog sport population it, or excuse me just the raw numbers of the dog sport population are lower in addition to the geography being so much bigger so our our population density as far as dog sport is vastly lower than that let me blow your mind let me i just learned about the statistics a few weeks ago so the third largest region in germany not the largest not the second largest. the third largest region in germany has more members than both the shirts and organizations combined in america (laughs) I i was like I would love to say that. I mean that that is that is a bigger discrepancy than I thought it was. Uh, Over five thousand members in one region. That's more put together than both both organizations. Hmm. That's yeah. something to be said right there. That is something to be said. Yeah. And, and you know what? We still compete with them as a country. I would love. We've I, beaten them. We've I, beaten them. I, I would really like people to keep that in mind that yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> oh i, I think that's a good place to call this one yeah. it was fun brother let's yeah. do one soon absolutely say hi to the family for me likewise thank you take care yeah.